Matthew chapter number 16. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting desire him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Tempted. They, they don't want proof. They're trying to get him to do something so they can kill him. They're at the point now with how can we catch him to do something illegal in front of all the people. And if we can do that. See, you know, in John, we talk about when they brought the woman caught in adultery. You know what they were trying to do to the people? Well, if he said, go ahead and stone her, well, what kind of compassion does he have on her? This loving Savior of God, he wants her stoned. And if he were to say, no, don't stone her, well, look at that. He violated the law. We just read in Matthew chapter 12, they came walking up to him, hey, Master, show us a sign. That he would show them a sign. Jews require signs. He's been healing in chapter 8. He's been healing in chapter 9. He has just fed 4,000 people. Which is going to come up in this chapter again. He's been doing enough signs. He's been doing enough miracles that these guys can't do. Come on, put 4,000 people in an auditorium or somewhere, a mess hall or something. And take a few pieces of bread and go ahead and feed them. And you have some nerve to walk up to them and say, Oh, we desire a sign from heaven. And what they want, they want it from God. If you're if you're of God and God's your father, well, give us a sign from God then. That's what they're saying. They're not asking for the stars to realign. They're not asking for the sun to come up early or the moon to come up. They want God approval. And he answered and said unto them, when it's evening, ye say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. Red, red sky in the morning is a sailor's warning. A red sky at night, a sailor's delight. That, that goes on 2016. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowery, gloomy, and cloudy. Oh, ye hypocrites. Here he goes again. Is it wrong for me to go up to a Roman Catholic priest? Hey, excuse me, sir, your, your thing's on backwards. No. He told them exactly what they were. You can discern the face of the sky. Look, you can tell the weather. But can ye not discern the signs of the times? Ooh. Just trying to see what the note I got here. Can't even tell. Uh... He says, listen, you, you look at the weather patterns. You, you can tell by the wind. You can tell by the color of the sky. And you can't see that what's going on in front of your eyes is not God? When was the last time somebody was fed of bread and little fishies? When was the last time you saw the... When... Oh, hold on, hold on. Let's go a little earlier, Matthew. Excuse me, Pharisees. When was the last time a leper came to the temple and said, I've been healed? How about that one? I bet you they had to dust off Leviticus 13, 14, or the Deuteronomy 13, 14. It's chapter 13, 14. When was the last time they had to open that up for a, for a leper that got cleaned and healed of Israel? No, only Naaman. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Now, according to Paul in Corinthians, Jews seek for a sign. Their nation was built upon... Moses coming. Look, my hand's leprous. Look, I turned the water into blood. Look, my rod is turned into a snake. That is the foundation of Israel. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's saying, hey, you guys are coming just to tempt me. A Jew is allowed to look for a sign from God because that's a proof of God. Not in this dispensation, though, of the church age. He's to look for Jesus Christ to be saved, not signs. Wait to Jacob's trouble. You know what a great sign for the Jew is and to realize he's in big trouble? Do you imagine what that's going to be? When the Bible says when God blows that trump and the church is gone, all the Christians are gone, dead and alive. 
that's a sign to Israel that what? Jacob's trouble's coming. And that will be a sign in heaven, heaven and earth. I wonder if the graves are going to, all the dirt is going to move. I don't know. But wouldn't that be a sign to tell you, uh-oh, we got trouble here. That entire church has disappeared. All my, uh, the saved people are gone from the graveyards. That's a sign. And there shall no sign be given unto it. But the sign of the prophet Jonas, again, chapter 12, they didn't get it. And he left them and departed. I've already told you what the sign was going to be. Jonas, Jonah and the whale, three days and three nights. Even Christians today, 2016, can't get that. Oh, Jonah never died. Well, then you just took away the sign spoken about Jesus. You're going to say Jonah didn't die? Don't preach the resurrection in the gospel of Jesus Christ. For Jesus died according to the scriptures, was buried, and arose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's Jonah. If you say Jonah didn't die and didn't go to hell, you can't preach the gospel according to Jesus. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Uh-oh. Trouble. Is going to brew. Then Jesus said unto him, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, Jesus, in a boat, he says, Listen, guys, those Pharisees and Sadducees, you be careful what of their leaven. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But their leaven. Now, he already knows what they're thinking. That's why he said leaven. Jesus can perceive our thoughts even though we don't make them vocal. You better understand that. When you're thinking in your heart, you don't have to say it. If, if somebody is from you, you don't like them, and you got the evil thoughts in your heart, God already knows those thoughts. And they reason among themselves, saying, it is because we have not taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, they didn't say it to him. There's Dr. Peter... We didn't take any bread, did we? No, John, we didn't take no bread. Oh, man. He's talking about leaven. He's hungry. What are we going to do, boys? Oh, ye little faith. Why reason ye amongst yourselves? They excluded Jesus from this conversation. Because ye have brought no bread. Oh, that's verse 5. He knew. He knows it all. Do ye not yet understand? Neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand. How many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand. How many baskets ye took? They didn't get it the first time, did they? They didn't get it in chapter 15, did they? They're not getting it in chapter 16. He fed 5,000 people. They took up 12 baskets. He fed 4,000. They took up 7 baskets. Now he mentions bread. We didn't bring any bread. Well, don't you think that G there was fish in each case, right? They're in a boat. Don't you think God was it? spoke to a couple fish? All right, jump in the boat. You think they would have done that? So you see the disciples had a problem walking with Jesus. God and there are some people out there who say oh let me see God or let me you know if I go walk with Jesus the disciples didn't get it and neither are they if I only walked with Jesus you have been just as lost in mind and spirit and, and body and soul as the disciples were you would not been in that boat thing. Oh yeah, he fed five thousand. He fed four thousand. He fed over ten thousand people. I don't need to no, know. That would not have been you. The four of them are fishermen. Don't you think they would have looked over and say, "Oh, there's a lot of fish in this water." How is it that you do not understand that I spank it not to you concerning bread? Understanding. That's your relationship with God in the Bible for understanding. I said it over and over. You can know how to start a car. 
You can apply your wisdom to drive your car to go get gasoline. The understanding of your car to, to drive and to use it and do everything with the motor vehicle for the understanding be, all right, I'm going to pick somebody up and bring them to church, or I'm going to go to church, or I'm going to go somewhere to, to tell someone about Jesus. Understand the relationship of God. They're thinking outside the boat. They're thinking flesh. They're thinking lust. They're thinking body. They're not thinking spirit and soul. That ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And when he said that, they're thinking, oh boy, we ain't got no food to eat. Jesus is like, then understood they how that he bade them not beware the leaven of bread. Now there's leaven in bread. And it was a violation of the law. Leaven is never good in the Bible. There's only one sacrifice given for the temple with leaven, and that's it. And that's the feast that matches the, the, the day of Pentecost. But of the doctrine of Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now, doctrine is what's taught. A little leaven leavens a whole lump. There was a woman who took a little leaven and hid it. False doctrine of Pharisees and Sadducees and religious and of men is called leaven. You put a little bit in there, and it's going to come out to be a big mess. And that's the trouble with the churches today. We'll put a little pagan holiday in there. Well, what worse can you get? Look where the churches are today. We'll give it a little magic. Look where you are today. We'll have one little show. Look where you're at today. One little rock concert. Look where you are today. Messed up. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi. Now this is interesting. This place, Caesarea Philippi. This city has been given to the god Pan. P-A-N. This is the God, small g, of all gods, small g. This will be the God of all gods. And here is Jesus asked his disciples of this God of all gods city, who am I? He asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? In this city of God worship, who am I? What's the word? And they said, some say that thou art John, John the Baptist. <coughs> Mark 6, 16, Herod. Uh, oh boy, my notes. Herod is reminded, I got that part, of what he'd done to John the Baptist. And we read that earlier in Matthew. So this 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 guy walking around, he's John the Baptist, the resurrected John the Baptist. Some Elias. Elijah. Well, that's Bible. Elijah's supposed to come back. And others, Jeremiah. So that's Jeremiah. This is a prophet that's persecuted by the leaders. You see what that statement is? This man, Jesus, walking around is being so persecuted by the people and by the land and by the rulers of the people. He's got to be Jeremiah. That's a bold statement that the people are acknowledging. Here is a guy, and the only thing we can see likened to him in the Bible is a man that's being persecuted by everybody. And one of the prophets it doesn't say who but he's one of the prophets and he said unto them but whom say ye that i am okay that's what the people think now the question is you are my followers you have been from me almost day one of my ministry since i came out of the wilderness since i made myself publicly known all right who do you think i am and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the anointed, the Christ, 
the Son of the Living God. He was right. Jumps right on. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Peter, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee. Not man's school, not man's education, not seminary, not Bible college. No man told Peter that thou art the Christ. But my Father, which is in heaven. Peter, when he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, no man taught him that. That is a divine providence of God telling Peter who that man is you're following. And I say unto thee, still talking to Peter, that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, now, some people take this as Peter, all right? Let's take for instance, you're talking to somebody. And you're carrying this conversation on like Jesus is having with Peter. And when he's addressing Peter, he's not going to say this. That's not proper English. He would say something. If he's talking about Peter uh, being a rock, he, he would say, Thou art Peter, and upon thee the rock. Something like that. But he's carrying a conversation with Peter. And he said, Upon this rock, and he's pointing to himself. Me. And only a non Bible studier, so you show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, would take that rock and say it's anything but Jesus Christ. When Paul writes to the Corinthian church, that rock is Christ. Now, how can you turn around and say, oh, that's just a man? Unless you want to build a heresy. He says, this rock, he's pointing to himself. I will build my church. And the gates of, what did Jesus say? You ever hear anybody say, Jesus said nothing about hell? We are in Matthew 16, verse 18, and he's mentioned hell three times. It's got to be a perverted Bible out there that's removed that word. I know what they put it as. Hades. Because I got a note here. Great. Hades. See, Luke 16, 23. No. Well, oh, Hades is an air conditioned hell. And as far as I've been out in the world for 18 years before I was saved, people would tell, and I would say, go to hell. I'd never tell you to go to Hades. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. How's that? How's that for security of the church? For salvation that's e eternal and everlasting. Hell cannot break through the church. The church will not go through the gates of hell. How's that? So now we're starting to get into a church. The Pharisees are blowing it. The Sadducees are blowing. The people are starting to, you know, they're starting to lean the, the other way about Jesus. They just want the food, the healing. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now here's another era. Here's another era taught by a church that's wrong. These keys are Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 10. One key is to the Jewish people. Acts chapter 2. They're all Jews there. They're just in Gentile cities. Acts chapter 10, when Peter goes into Cornelius' house and smells the, the pork and cooking and all that, making him sick, trying to keep away from the family dog, that's the key to the Gentiles. Peter is giving for the church. He's giving the open door to the Jews. 
that Paul kinds of kinds of clothes it, but leaves it open for the Jews, Romans chapter 10. But Peter is the apostle that goes right out, and here's a Jewish family, I mean, excuse me, here's a Gentile Italian family of all the first families that get saved. The, Ethiop the Ethiopian eunuch was only one man. But more than one Gentile, Italian, that Peter said, I don't want to go over there. Lord, I've never gone anything unclean. Oh, yes, you have, you've got to go open that door, Peter. I don't care if it stinks. I don't care if it's against the law. We're done with that. How's that? Now the door is going. To, that key will open to the Gentiles getting saved. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, there's a couple times that in the book of Acts, the apostles got to get together, they got to meet. They don't have a complete New Testament. And they've got questions now about these Gentiles getting saved. Do we put them under the law? Do we not put them under the law? What do we do, boys? There are people out there telling the Gentiles you got to get circumcised because that's what we do. But the law is going away. During the church age. So Peter has to go to these councils with James who stands up and says, you know what? This is what we're going to do. This is going to be the commandment, the laws of the church. Refrain from things strangled. Refrain from fornication. And I forget what the third thing is. They all say, hey, yeah, okay, that's great. That's exactly what the Gentiles should do. It's bound. And those words are bound in heaven, set by the apostles, with no written Bible. Now, we are bound to the Bible today, the 66 books, with the, with the verse that says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I am not told to go build the ark. And yet two people today in this world are going to build the ark. That's not my salvation. My salvation is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's what the Bible says. I am not under the law. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And I'm going to sneeze in a minute. So the apostles are given the power with Peter. Make, make some rules, make some regulations, make some commandments. Because the Bible has not been written yet. Once the Bible's finished, then charge he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Well, he's in a city that's not going to receive him. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are not going to believe it. It's going to cause all kinds of commotion, and it's not Jesus' time, according to the Gospel of John. But when they get in the book of Acts, where did they go? Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Right now, they're not going to receive it. The nation has rejected the Christ. The Messiah of the Jew. That's what he's saying. From that time forth, this is a major turning point. The Pharisees and the Sadducees brought on a major turning point in the Bible, in the book of Matthew. Began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders, the authority of Israel, the chief priests, the Levites, that God has ordained by the law and the scribes. <coughs> those in charge of the writings and be killed death and be raised again the third day you know he just told his disciples in what we, I assume is private remember what I said in Matthew 12 well it wasn't Matthew 12 but you know, you know I just said to the Pharisee no sign but the sign of Jonas I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried. I'm going to raise again. Jonah died. He was buried in the whale. And he came up out of the whale. That's what he just told his disciples. He told the disciples 
what the Pharisees he did not tell, and what the scribes and Sadducees he did not tell. That sign of Jonas is, I'm going to die, I'm going to be buried, and I'm coming out of the grave. Now, did they get that according to the gospel? They didn't even believe the women when they came back and said to the angel, said, he's not here, he's risen. Well, no women, they got, I don't know what's wrong with them. Thomas, unless I see the print of those nails, I don't believe. Well, they're right here listening to Jesus say it. Then Peter took him. I like to know what he meant by took him. And began to rebuke him. Peter is rebuking God. On what the what, what is the what is the gospel? Christ died for our sins. What? According to the scriptures, right? So he tells him what the scriptures say, and Peter says, I rebuke you. You're wrong. You're not telling the truth. Saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. You're not going to die. Now, you know where Peter's heart is. He loves the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you got a loved one, and their death is imminent, you know, if you've been arrested as a Christian as Fox Book of Mars, and they say, Saturday, you're going to the faggots. We're going to torture you on Sunday. You don't really want to believe it. But it's so. And you can't rebuke Peter. He loves the Lord Jesus Christ so much. He, Peter is saying, I don't want to go. I mean, excuse me, I don't want you to go. But he turned, Jesus turned and said unto Peter, which they say is the first pope, Get thee behind me, Satan. How's that for the first pope? God addresses Satan through men. Ezekiel 28, the king of Tyre. There are times when Satan will get in somebody and then will be the ambassador and representative of Satan. And that's what Satan just did in here now. He got Peter some way, somehow to say, oh, that ain't going to happen. And what Jesus says, thou art offense unto me. Offended at Satan. Because he made Peter say that. And not because Jesus feels sorry for what Peter said. It's the statement by Satan would be, don't go to Calvary. I'm going to use Peter to say that. You don't need to go. you got these 12 men. They love you, Jesus. Don't go. That's Satan's motive. And that would be an offense to Jesus if Calvary would stop. For thou savest not the things that be of God, Satan. Satan does not want anything God wants. Satan does not want anything that God wants finished and finished. And when Jesus dies on that cross, he says, it is finished. Satan does not want Jesus to say that. Now, on account of Peter, human love for another human, best friends, buddies, lifelong partners, I don't want you to go. But you got to go. Because then it wouldn't be finished. And if Jesus listened to Peter and Satan, we would never be saved. But though, but those that be of men, then it's hard to say goodbye to a loved one. But in some cases, you know what? It's the best thing. It ends suffering. It ends trials and tribulations. And if they're saved, they're absent from the body and present with the Lord. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father today, right now. Never to be whipped again. Never to be beaten again. 
<coughs> then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. There's no self, no self-centeredness. It's others. Take up his cross and follow me. A Christian is to carry his cross. Didn't say Jesus' cross. Said his cross. God has all of us to bear a cross. And I don't mean getting a piece of wood and making a cross and walking down the street for 1,400 miles or whatever. God never called anybody to do that. That's foolish. That's just to make people, oh, look, let's get a picture with them. Let's put them in the newspaper. Let's make them a celebrity. And they're foolish. A cross is a burden. And Jesus said, all right, cast your burdens upon him. And he says, follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. Well, that's not the church age. That's works. This is the cost of discipleship. You know, you want riches, fame, and all that? Well, then you know what? You're going to lose your discipleship. You, you cannot walk with Christ and be cold or lukewarm. All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's a cross. And if you get along with your with your say with your lost family, you get along with your lost co-workers, you get along with your lost neighbors, you don't have your cross. And whosoever will lose his life, money, riches, fame, love, cares, friendship, for my sake. That's very important shall find it you got to take up the burden of being a Christian a disciple for the sake of Jesus Christ that means you got to obey the Bible you got to rightly divide the Bible and it will cost you money it will cost you promotion it will cost you friends it will cost you family it will cause you troubles and problems and anguish and you also now have Satan as your enemy. Listen, if you don't get up in the morning and all the devils in hell scramble to get dressed and get ready because they're afraid of what you're going to do, you've done something right. But if you get up in the morning and all the angels, is, I mean all the, the devils in hell, just start yawning and go back to sleep and snooze button, you ain't doing nothing for God. When those devils came before Jesus, they like, oh, is it before our time? The devils try to stop Paul from preaching using the Jews. Got to stop that. But what is a man profited? profit if he shall gain the whole world run that back to Matthew chapter 4 when Satan offered Jesus all the world and lose his own soul that's going to be the same Antichrist one day he's going to gain it all the only way you can get under the Antichrist is if you receive his mark he's going to gain the entire world and he's going to lose his soul There are people who sell out to Satan so they can get whatever they want. Whatever their pleasures are. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What are you going to give God in exchange? When the exchange is, according to Acts 20:28, 20, is God's blood. What can be better than God's blood? 
And there are people out there in religions that say God's blood is not important because if this cookie and this wafer is better, this magazine's better. If I do penance, that's better. If I do this, this is better. If I belong to this church, this is better. God will receive, and no, he won't. Not when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What else can you give for your soul besides Jesus Christ? Absolutely nothing. It's either Psalms 2, and but definitely Proverbs 1. God shall laugh. When the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. That's not us. That's the second advent. Some of them works, the reward they're going to get is fire and death and hell. Some of the Gentiles are going to get the millennial reign because they helped the Jews. The Jews who have run from the Antichrist, who have re rejected the Antichrist, are going to go in the promised land in the millennium. Verily I say unto you, I don't understand this verse. And I'll tell you what I think after I read it, but it's what I think. There, sh there be some standing here which shall not taste of death. Till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. All the apostles, the disciples, including Judas and Paul, died. And Jesus had not come back yet. I'm going to say two things, and they're probably, I don't know, they're probably ridiculous. Peter, James, and John are going to go on the Mount of Transfiguration next chapter. They're going to see the Lord in his glory, but not his kingdom. So, I throw that 1% yay and 99% nay. John, the, the, uh, the beloved disciple, before he dies, sees the Lord Jesus Christ in his kingdom when he writes and sees the visions of the book of Revelation. He tells you about Jesus mounting up on the horse, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and the saints coming with him. He talks about the millennial reign. Satan bound for a thousand years. I'm going to say that's 50-50 because I don't know. Some things I don't know. But he's talking to the apostles, the disciples. <coughs> The only one I could think would match that would be John. But I may be wrong. I'm not afraid to say I don't know. Because I don't know. <laughs>